Welcome to um, the end of your industrial hygiene Master of Science career. If you're in sampling, you must be within a few credits of graduation. My name is Teresa Stack. I'm an associate professor and I will be your main instructor for sampling and evaluation of health hazards. So this short lecture will cover an introduction, how to navigate Moodle, and then just give you a brief background to sampling. So this course teaches techniques and procedures as stipulated by safety and health regulations and regulatory agencies for the evaluation of occupational safety and health hazards arising from both physical and chemical agents. And it includes developing a sampling strategy and calibration of personal monitoring equipment, as well as the use of different types of instrumentation for assessing a employee's overall exposure to workplace contaminants. Um, by the end of this course, you'll learn about passive monitoring, direct reading instruments, we'll go over report writing, as well as calibration, how to develop a sampling strategy and a sampling protocol selection. We'll look at um, sampling for different gas phases, surface sampling, um, aerosols, as well as particles. We'll do some exposure assessment. So let's just take a look at our Moodle page. And you can see how it is set up with contact information in this block. The two texts, which are recommended, um, both of which are listed here. There's the link to the NIOSH Manual of Analytical Methods and a link to the OSHA Technical Manual. And then to navigate the course is pretty simple. Um, all of the emails that you receive will go through this announcement blog. So if you click on it, you can see all of the emails. Currently there's none there. Um, as well as a document that describes your expectations for some of the assignments that you um, submit. Certainly you can submit handwritten calculations as long as I can read them. If you want to scan them or take pictures, that would be fine. So if you just click on um, one of the blocks, you can see that there's a lecture here. Most of these will come with recorded lectures and that would be listed right underneath. As you see for um, types of sampling, there's both the PowerPoint as well as the YouTube link and then your um, if there's an assignment that's associated with it it'll be listed underneath that particular block. Please note that for forums or blogs usually there's two due dates um, one on the Wednesday or Thursday and then all the due dates for the assignments tend to be a Monday night to make it um, easy for the distance students to be able to um, Submit your assignments. I know that sometimes it's quite difficult. So I think the website is pretty um, easy to navigate. You can see that the time periods are listed in each block what will be covered and the lectures are available to you as well as the homework and some extra reading material. Um, so Moodle is pretty straightforward and easy to navigate for this particular class. Also, the information for the summer lab is there for you as well. I thought I'd briefly introduce myself to you, although I'm sure most of you have had me in a class before. I'm an associate professor at Montana Tech. I've been here since 2013. I'm also the Bachelor of Science Occupational Safety and Health Program Man Manager and the coordinator for our three ABET programs. I am a certified safety professional and a certified professional ergonomist. I have a master's degree from the University of Washington in occupational and environmental health and a bachelor's degree from the University of Connecticut in natural resource management and engineering. 
Most of my career has been with the United States Navy supporting their mishap prevention and hazard abatement program. Um, I teach both undergraduate and graduate level classes here at Montana Tech. I have a wide range of sampling experience, predominantly with the physical hazards, noise, vibration, thermal exposure, as well as, of course, air sampling exposure. I have a little ex um, experience with evaluating dermal exposures, but we'll work some of that in um, as well. And um, I have two young children, Mackenzie, who is 12, and David, who is 10. I live in Sheridan, Montana, which is an hour from Butte, Montana, so I commute every day. And the picture you see here is, um, it was minus 25 degrees on a December morning, and we decided to throw some boiling water in the air and see what would happen. And my dog Maggie is in there as well. I certainly look uh, forward to learning a lot from each one of you and then getting the opportunity to meet in June. So what you will need for the course is an open mind and an empty notebook to be able to take um, lots of notes. So other resources, we have the two um, texts, a strategy for assessing and managing occupational exposures. It doesn't matter to me what um, version you have, usually the older the version or the older the edition. Of course, the newer the material, but the more uh, mistakes that have been corrected, as well as the occupational environment, it's evaluation and control, which most industrial hygiene professionals have anyway. We also access the ACJH TLVs. Um, you won't need to buy that text, of course. Anything that you need for the class, I'll post it for you. And then the two links for the OSHA Technical Manual and the NIOSH Manual of Analytical Methods. We'll use those for this class as well. So my philosophy is I'd like to foster um, learning through patterning the educational requirements within this class against the CIH, the CSP, um, and the CPE blueprints that are practically applicable to your job. So this can be used somewhat as a prep for the CIH within this specific area of sampling and evaluation of health hazards. And we always continue to go back and forth through the blueprint and reevaluate our classes. Um, some material here you may be very familiar with and other material may be quite new to you. So take out of it what, of course, you can. And just for a brief, very brief history on um, occupational exposures, certainly one of the first documented occupational exposures was amongst minors, and this was due to lead poisoning. And as you know, lead interferes with a variety of body processes and is toxic to most organs quite um, significantly. The nervous system, and this is a picture of workers who are ladling molten um, lead into different billets, and they have the potential for overexposure, but you can see they're in their proper personal protective equipment. And I just thought I'd throw this one in. Certainly you don't need to read the speaker notes, but right here in Bozeman, Montana, which is about 50 miles from in 2014, um, federal agents raided USA Brass because of um, overexposures to lead. Their eating facilities were not quadrant off from the bullet reloading facilities, and workers had um, significant levels of lead um, in their blood and um, a worker had actually called into OSHA because he was so concerned. So we can fast forward, but sometimes we can't um, prevent all of the exposures. Chapter one does a great job of, of covering the history of occupational safety and health and industrial hygiene, but very rarely do you see any history brought into the forefront for the specific topic of sampling for agents in the environment um, or in the occupational 
workplace. Of course, all occupational is workplace, but I mean in the workplace. But canaries were regularly used in coal mines as an early warning system. So toxic gases such as carbon monoxide, methane, and carbon dioxide would kill the bird and make it stop singing um, before it would affect the miners. So the, the signs of distress were um, well documented and used as early as 1930. And that's where the phrase a canary in a coal mine comes from. A canary in a coal mine um, is a song that talks about somebody who's able to foresee a crisis before it comes. And because mining is so prevalent in um, Butte, when you're able to visit, you'll see the, one of the mining um, museums of the world here. And we were on the forefront of some of the in labor industry movements as early as the 1960s. So I, I think that when we talk about the history of sampling, our first sampler was our um, beautiful yellow canaries. And then there's always um, Dr. Alice Hamilton, who was an expert in industrial hygiene medicine at a time when American cities were beginning to become transformed from laborers who were out in the field to large groups of people being brought together because of the Industrial Revolution and being put into factories. And there was no environmental or, of course, occupational controls that were in place and um, she continued to be an advocate well after her um, retirement and the occupational safety and health act was passed in 1970 just a couple of months after she had um, passed away but certainly she was the um, founding matriarch of occupational safety and health the effective respirator is ages old for thousands of years, men have suffered, yes, and died, because of the air they breathed. 500 years B.C., the Greeks discovered that metal miners had trouble in breathing, but that is all they knew about it. Around the beginning of the Christian era, the Romans learned what caused the trouble, dust. So dye factory workers covered their faces with goat bladders, which enabled them to see a little and kept out the poisonous dust a little. Almost 1,650 years later, a Dutch physician examined the lungs of a stone cutter who had died of asthma. They were so clogged with dust, he said, it seemed as though they were made of sand, and men continued inhaling stone dust. Fifty years later, an Italian doctor observed glass workers turning their covered faces away from the powders they were grinding. It didn't help. Men went on inhaling glass dust. A hundred and fifty years later, a Scotch professor of medicine wrote that stonemasons in Edinburgh usually suffered with lung trouble before reaching fifty. But he didn't know why. It wasn't until 1902 that the British government appointed a committee of doctors to investigate the high death rate among miners. It took years of study and work to purify food. No less was required to clean the air. The problem was tackled from several angles. By watering dry jobs, dust is held down. Exhaust hoods suck it away. And air conditioning not only cools, but cleans the air. In some cases, one or more of these methods was sufficient. But in many others, something more was needed. A practical economical device that would guarantee that no harmful amounts of dust or fume could enter a man's lungs. Since the Romans tried hiding their heads in goat bladders, men have known that the answer was some kind of screen to cover the nose and the mouth, one that would successfully filter out impurities. The difficulty lay in making a screen fine enough to trap the smallest particles, yet easy to breathe through and comfortable to wear. Throughout the world, people tried various devices, from a plain handkerchief through which you breathed in both air and dust, to elaborate masks through which you could hardly breathe at all. All kinds of materials were used. Gauzes, which kept out the big dust but let in the fine harmful particles, woolen fabrics which warmed the face but didn't clean the air, and wet sponges which didn't even warm the face. 
It seemed as though we'd never be able to clean the air we breathe. So just a brief review on the practice of industrial hygiene. The anticipation and recognition of the potential for occupational health problems is certainly a prerequisite for the implementation of industrial hygiene activities. And early attempts tried to quantify exposure, and it wasn't certainly until years um, within Dr. Hamilton's investigation that they truly understood the hazards that were leading to certain occupational disorders. I believe that sometimes, at least I see on review during the comp exam, that it's this anticipation phase that um, is somewhat left out because we walk into a workplace and we automatically recognize what we see as dust in the air or we smell it or we see the way workers react through our observational methods, and then we'll evaluate and control them. But let's not leave out that anticipation um, linkage where understanding the process, we can certainly have an idea of what we're going to see before we actually walk into the anticipation phase. And I believe that this definitely depends on what your job is, what industry you're in, and how often those work processes change. When I was with the Navy, I worked in more of a consultation um, type of work environment, and therefore I always had to anticipate what I was going to see through much previous research and speaking with uh, management and reading the standard operating procedures before I was able to go in and um, recognize and then evaluate them. So industrial hygiene is a science of anticipating, recognizing, evaluating, and controlling workplace conditions that may cause workers injury or illness. Industrial hygienists use environmental monitoring and analytical methods to detect the extent of the worker's exposure and also to evaluate what types of control measures are put into place and whether they're effective or not or should be changed along with the changing process. So we anticipate before, we realize beforehand through research, input from workers, our own um, evaluation, observational techniques. And then we evaluate, um, so that's anticipation and recognition. Recognition being identifying it through knowledge. So first we anticipate what we're going to see and then we actually take a look to see whether it's there and whether our subjectiveness was validated through doing some further research right within that working environment. Evaluation is really what we're going to focus this portion of the class on and it's to determine um, mostly quantitatively, although sometimes qualitatively, um, how much of a contaminant is in the air, and that way we can, um, or um, on a surface, and we can evaluate that over the course of time and see whether our controls are working or not. And that's what this uh, course will focus on. Accurate measurement for calibration, data collection, and sample handling, as well as um, probably more review for many of you. But the um, evaluation of that, um, those concentrations to determine whether a worker is within a overexposure situation or not, at or below an action limit, whether our controls are working or our exposures are creeping up on us. So not only the data collection, but then that evaluation of that data. So in the next module, we'll go through and do a little bit of a um, math review for you, but certainly don't forget that sampling is um, some subset of a population that if it is not um, representative of the population then what we sample has no validation within the truth. 
So our methods need to be as clean and as precise as possible because there's errors built in um, that are going to be exasperated over time if we're not careful in controlling or minimizing our errors. So we cannot sample everyone all the time due to time and cost and therefore if it's possible putting people into similar exposure groups is always a sound sampling strategy and we'll spend some more time looking at those concepts as we move further along into the course. So industrial hygiene is the science and some folks believe the art, um, but I think it's an interdisciplinary science of anticipating, recognize, evaluating, and maybe the art is in the controlling of stressors in the occupational setting. Sampling this course will focus on the evaluation phase using quantit qu quantitative measurement techniques and some qualitative measurement techniques. And a sampling strategy or plan um, can only be put into place once we define what our objectives are. So that ends this unit. There are some materials to uh, review, and I hope you have a splendid day.